Welcome back to the Table Rush Talk Show. I'm your host, Misha Zvegensoff. Today, we welcome Troy Truand, a seasoned entrepreneur from Tasmania with a rich background in nurturing small businesses. From launching his first business at age 10 to owning equity in over 40 companies globally, Troy brings a treasure trove of experiences, both ex exhilarating and educational. Get ready to dive into the insights of overcoming business challenges and harnessing growth, all seasoned with Troy's spirited approach to entrepreneurship. Troy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Misha. Great to chat with you again, and thanks a lot for having me on. Yeah, indeed. I'm super excited to have have you here. Um, we did get a have a great pre conversation a week or two ago, and I thought what was fascinating was how much you have going on, or how much you've done, or maybe a better way to say it is how much success you've had. So you launched uh, a whiskey brand in 2007. You've uh, traveled, the, lived around the world. Um, you, one of the really cool things was you started a course on starting a distillery and you have 600 people in there. Uh, I'm sure the list goes on and on. Um, oh yes. You sit on four boards including Australia's oldest golf course. What is that yep. golf course, per chance? Yeah, it's called Ratho Farm. 1822 it was settled. It's about an hour out of Hobart, where I live here in, in Tasmania, which Tasmania is a small island just south of Melbourne, about half a million people. Yeah, it's a beautiful course. Great to learn on, too. Yeah, fantastic. And I just really wanted to, we'll get, dig a bit, dig deeper into your experience later, but I just really wanted to set a frame for what we're going to talk about now, and is and that is what you are doing now. So let's get right into it, Troy. What is it that you're doing right? What What is it that you're doing now? Well, the best way to, to summarize what I do is help small businesses grow with ease so the owner can live the lifestyle they signed up for. Because a lot of us, I think, that, that start out um, that you know, chasing that dream of being able to work um, the hours you want or when you want to work those 80 hours a week that is uh and i think that's a myth that a lot of people think small business is much easier than what it actually is and that's something i'm passionate about breaking that myth pretty early on so one to dissuade people from actually starting a business if it's not right for them and that's the the premise behind the distillers institute the online course business you mentioned uh, when we put course one out there, we wanted to um, convince or educate enough people not to go into a distilling business because it's capital intensive, but also small business is not for everyone. It's, it, it, it can be a lot harder than, uh, than what most people think. And how are you sussing that out of people? So you have a line of questioning you'd like to ask or, yeah. But yeah, it's really education up front and then, and, seeing if they've got the wherewithal just to, to have the persistence to stick it through. But in the last 10 years or so, I, I kind of moved away from helping startups and we now really focus on those people that are already going, have a business, have at least five team members, rent the five to 30 team member mark because we believe people are the hardest thing in small business and its greatest asset. So we think we can help a lot more business owners that already have an existing team as opposed to just starting out um, even if they've got less than five team members, um, we'd much prefer to help the ones in that five to 30 zone. Fantastic. And anybody listening, watching right now, go to growasmallbusiness.com, growasmallbusiness.com. That's Troy's uh, landing page where you can follow along what we're talking about. Everybody should go click on business transformation program. Again, the tab is business transformation program, and uh, you've got another one of those. The next cohort, cohort starting in thirty-one days. Uh, so yeah, everybody go there. But let's dive into it a little bit. Let's talk about your business transformation program and what's going on there. What's the thesis, perhaps? Or yeah, I might go back a step if that's okay. Um, yes. So I started in business in nineteen ninety nine. So I did a double degree at uni. Uh, a bachelor in business, majoring in accounting and a bachelor of computing, and then worked for the largest accounting firm in the world, PricewaterhouseCoopers, for three years right out of uni. And that's my one and only ever job. Uh, in late 99, started two internet companies. One was a gift e-tailer, so my business partner had a couple of large gift stores in Melbourne, in Australia. And so that was out panning for gold, as they like to say. And then I had another business, which is selling the shovels 
and all the equipment, which is where most people made their fortunes in the gold rushes. And that was a web design development company, which is still going today and growing quite well, almost 100 team members in six offices. And so that started my entrepreneurial journey, basically, in late 99, working ridiculous hours, 100-hour weeks, sometimes sleeping in the the gift warehouse. Uh, And I I wouldn't recommend that to anyone these days. Um, Just the youthful exuberance, I guess, at age 26, uh, got me, uh, got really got me into it. And then from there, um, we started or bought uh, a handful of other businesses before I moved to London for four years to buy into a small IT sport company, grew that for three and a half years. And then on the way back, moving back to Australia, I had two weeks in Thailand and thought, I want to get out of selling time, professional services, and, and uh, want to get into a product-based business. So that's uh, when I got back, a, a friend of mine had just bought the last 443 barrels of New Zealand whiskey. And so I ran that for a few years. Then I was the first CEO at a, a, a Australia's oldest craft distillery, which is based here in Tasmania. Did that for two years and went back to New Zealand whiskey collection. We did a crowdfund, built our distilleries because we were running out of whiskey, obviously. And so that, pro- that move to a product-based business kind of fell into my lap. But those two weeks in Thailand, I... Uh, couldn't believe that dot com was available for grow a small business. So I grabbed it and I wrote uh, around 30 blog posts because I was getting hit up a lot in London and when I was living in Melbourne for advice and mentorship. And I was just finding myself repeating myself a lot. So hence I put these blog posts together so I could just send them the links uh, and educate people a lot quicker and more thoroughly rather than me just one-on-one spending a lot of time. That's pretty much where grow a small business was born. So you register Grow a small business. What year is this again? Uh, That was early 2011, January 2011, yeah. And what kind of questions are you getting asked all the time? Uh, A lot of it's around people, like how do you manage people? How do you recruit people? People are a pain in the ass. What do I do? And I always retort with, well, uh, that's your fault because you, you're the owner, you're the manager of the business, and you need to, you know, skill yourself up on how to become a world class manager. Um, so the first thing is, as we like to say, recruitment's the most important thing a manager does. So you've got to get that right first. Get A players on your bus, as Jim Collins coined in Built to Last and Good to Great, awesome books, um, and then manage. Uh, your people well. So and that's why it kind of leads us into why we've got the business transformation program. Because as I said before with the blogs, 80% of the time in our teachings and coachings, we're repeating ourselves the same message. So we can help a lot more small business owners by putting 80% of uh, those teachings into three courses, effective leadership, kick-ass management, and transform your performance, which is a, a productivity course for the entire team to do. So that then allows the 30-minute weekly one-on-one uh, in the 16-week program that I have with business owners, we can really hone in on what the specific issues are that week in the business, the number one growth challenge, they're having a people problem. Um, you know, I can give a, a lot more um, advice around that specific issue while they're going through the courses 30 minutes a day, for example. Um, and, and we're finding it's working really well, we're getting amazing feedback and results and really transforming some some businesses around Australia. And we've had students in New Zealand and Fiji at the moment too. Awesome. Tell me the three uh, courses again, or the three. Um, yeah, the three the three levels. It maps to. Uh, have you read the Michael Gerber's book, The E Myth Revisited? I have not. Sounds like I need to, though. But you should. It's the first book I recommend anyone read if they're thinking of starting a business, but particularly if they're already going and they want to grow, definitely read that book. It, it's an absolute gem. And Gerber talks about three roles in that book the technician, the manager, and the entrepreneur. So the technician is. Uh, let's say you're you're an accountant, you're working for someone else, you're doing the accounting work, that's the technical work. And then the manager is obviously managing a team and then the entrepreneur is, is you know, the owner, taking the risks, having the vision, et cetera. So we've mapped the, that concept to the, our three courses. So effective leaders for the small business owner to do so they uh, can lead their team a lot better. So that works on things like vision mission, core values, but particularly their communication because we th- tend to think we communicate enough, whereas it's not uh, more frequent enough or enough information to our team. 
And then the middle course, I think, is the most valuable because there's not a lot of great material out there to train managers on how to manage people. Technicians get promoted because they're a great technician, but they're often not then given any training and resources to then learn how to effectively manage people. So we put that course together, and that's that's half of the 16 weeks. And then the final course is for the entire team, which is for the technicians, basically, not helping them with their technical work, but helping them be more professional uh, and less stressed. So doing everything they say they will do. And we give them tools and templates uh, in that course for everyone to do. The owner does it first, then the managers and the rest of the team. And we start out with a great story, um, the secret of guaranteed success, and then a tool that that goes along with that, a free tool to help um, people implement that. And anyone can do that course actually on, on our website. You don't need to sign up to the program. It's a free two-week course, um, but it is included in the program as well. Awesome. 16-week course. Who best fit? Who's best fit for this course? I know you already said uh, uh, small small businesses, 5 to 50 employees or 5 to 10 employees, perhaps looking to level up or go ahead with that. Yeah, it's 5 to 30 team members we, we've found uh, because, again, about half of our teachings, both in the course and the one-on-ones, are uh, around the people side of things, so recruitment, onboarding, lead- leading the team and managing the team. Um, and it's any industry anywhere in the world because the growth issues are all the same, we're finding, in in the industries. They don't really change. It, it ties back to the five pillars that we've named, uh, the growth pillars, so people, strategy, marketing, funding, and systems. And so our program c- c- takes you through all those pillars with, you know, 50% of that on on the people pillar. Awesome. What, what someone listening to this is a small business, uh, five to 30 employees, team members, what sort of pain points are going to be resonating with them or what would speak to that a little bit? Yeah, that's one of the things we identify early is which pillar is is the number one growth challenge at the moment. And more often than not, it's the people one, but sometimes it could be a marketing issue. And that could be, now we're not a marketing agency, but we've got the basics covered for small business owners, particularly to swat up because we coach and say, even if you don't own the marketing corner, you've either got a marketing manager or an assistant on or you use an agency, the owners, we believe, should uh, educate themselves more around marketing uh, or the, the key concepts around marketing. So it could be a marketing problem we help in 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 that way. One of the other big pieces we help with every owner in there is to put together their 10-year financial model because we believe strategic planning and small business should start with the numbers. So you shouldn't be making decisions and lofty, big, hairy, audacious goals as Jim Collins coined uh, without putting them into a, a sheet to show the numbers and, and the return and, and really fine-tune your assumptions to make sure you've got some evidence to say, well, this key number, why do you think that, you know, it's so important and critical for the success of the business over 10 years? Show, point to something that can to, can back that up. Yeah. Are, are you finding the the entrepreneurs or the business owners that are jumping in your course are they stressed for time? Like they're yeah. just burnt? Yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's another common theme. And and then that comes back to uh, we're all control freaks or well, most of us that start businesses up. So that's something we really got to knock out of owners is you've got to let go. You've got to delegate because if you've got a team of A players, they actually want more work. They want challenging, interesting work. And so they're, they're there. You can keep pushing stuff down the org chart so you can unlock more of your time to either focus on marketing or if you're the the um, rainmaker on sales, for example, and especially to be leading the team. So you're unlocking more time and that's how you can clamber up that, that org chart. So a delegation is a big point that we, we work on with owners and their managers because their managers do the, the, the kick-ass manager course as well at no extra cost and including the future ones. So the, the whole organization, the whole business is being managed in the same style. Yeah. And, I was watching your video. There's a video on the business transformation program at the growasmallbusiness.com at your site. But Sharon is speaking on there. And it's at least in that little uh, clip you've got going on, she was, there's some tension around delegating. She was delegating, but not taking accountability or not even know how to hire people or or maybe speak to that a little bit. What, what was going on there? 
Yeah, Sharon's got a great business in Melbourne, bookkeeping and accounting business, and she's starting to pile the team members on, particularly from offshore at the moment in the Philippines. And it, it's just it's a common thing we see is owners have that mentality of no one else can do it better than I. And our point is, well, you're here because you want to grow, and if you want to grow, you've got to let go. And that is a skill that you need to develop is to delegate and, again, to manage the people well, communicate, having clear job descriptions, keep them to one page because a lot of people just blow them out to two, three, four pages and they're just totally ineffective. So, um, you know, Sharon was one of those owners that was feeling stressed for time as well. And and as I've said, you know, the key to that is effective delegation. And that's something she's become really good at and, and realised that uh, particularly her longest serving offshore team member wants to be a team leader and manage the rest of the team as she's building them out. So she's been able to take stuff off her plate, Sharon's plate, to give it to this this team member that, and grooming them ready to step into that team leader role. When I'm imagining uh, as you're bringing on employees growing, there's the short-term pain of trying to teach that person or get them up to speed or speak to that a little bit. Is there shortcuts around that or just get used to it? That's what it's going to take or get your SOPs in line or, yeah, there's a couple of good things on that, Misha. Um, so onboarding, it's it's been shown that if you invest, we recommend, uh, you know, that you should be investing 90 days, the first 90 days, so three months, more time, it's even just half an hour a week, the manager with that new person to onboard them effectively. And the, the data has shown that retention goes up, people stay longer, they're more engaged and they're more productive rather than you just throwing them the keys and the laptop on the day one and say, well, we'll see you, you know, at the end of the week. But actually, because it's quite an anxious thing, anyone starting a new job, they don't know what to expect. So yeah, that is definitely one um, powerful thing that, that we introduce to, you know, people going through our program. Um, and SOPs, so the systems pillar, we talk a lot about that, having an operations manual, which comes from the E-Myth book, um, Gerber's concept, and then putting systems in place, procedures, and getting the team, building the culture of the team of, of leaning on that operations manual and the operations timetable, building standard operating procedures, both written, but even just using video, Loom videos, record yourself doing something in a system, for example, and then you know, because of the pillars, systems is always ongoing. You're going to have to be tweaking those. Uh, you, you're the strategy pillar, you, you probably only have to revisit every year or so. Um, and and funding is, is another pillar that is n not continually needing to be addressed. But the two big, one, big ones are the people and the marketing pillar. So as, as I coined, the, the growth seesaw, you've got to go out and do the marketing to bring the sales in and then turn around, walk the other end of the seesaw to hire more people to then take on that extra workload. So you're always walking up and down that growth seesaw uh, as you're growing the business, whereas the other three pillars are fairly, you know, constant. Are you, I heard you say something interesting and I want to know if I heard it right. The onboarding process, that is more of a gentle, you're, 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 you're not just bringing someone on and, and having a hardcore onboarding and saying, here you go, get after it. It's more of a, of a, of a soft entry to get somebody acclimated and then let's go. Is that what I heard you say? Yeah, that's right. It's very, it's structured. You should have an onboarding plan and that starts even before day one, because often um, new employees don't hear from the employer in the two or three weeks before they start, but it's really powerful to have that some communications beforehand welcoming them and also setting up expectations. This is what your first day is going to look like. Um, and on top of the weekly one-on-one, -on -one, which we recommend, there's an extra onboarding weekly meeting that you should have with a, a new hire to make sure how are you going, any questions, are you stuck anywhere, give us some feedback, et cetera. So we're finding that is, is quite powerful. And uh, throughout each of the three courses, there's uh, some books that we recommend you listen along the way to really drive home some of these messages. And one of those books is a great one by another Australian called Bradley Giles, who wrote the book Onboarded. And he's got a lot of great stats in there about how powerful nailing onboarding is, because a lot of business owners just don't do it. They just think, oh, they're there, they're here to do the work and let them go. And it's, you know, they're really missing a trick. Mm. 16 weeks, uh, mostly owners or owners and team members. Who, who's going through? 
Yeah, the business owner does the 16 weeks on their own. And so they do the effective leader course first and the key cast manager uh, and the transform your performance course. And then once they've done the the kick ass manager course, once they fit the program's finished, they can the course encourages them to then send, you know, tailor this template email to introduce kick ass manager course to your other managers and get your managers to do that court that eight week course and then everyone to do the transform your performance course. So it's all set out. It's uh, in the order that if you know Misha, if I could go back into the DeLorean in time, jump into the DeLorean and jump, go back in time. This is all the teachings and material and templates that I would give myself 25 years ago. So I would get to success much faster and, and probably still have hair, um, that, especially that wasn't gray. Um, after what, you know, 15, over 15 of my own businesses, 30 business partners in three countries, I've seen a lot and made a lot of mistakes, which I don't, you know, I'm, I hope I'm here to help other small business owners avoid those mistakes. That's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> your within 16 weeks are are people seeing tangible revenue tangible tangible margin uh results i'm not sure if i'm saying that correctly or roi if you want to call it or well because a lot of the the work that needs to be done one takes a, a, a long time to to roll out because you know half the teachings are around people so it can take time for tangible results to be seen but there are some quick wins we often will um touch in on for example pricing when, when we're in the marketing corner we we have a look and say well, when, when was the last time you checked your competitor pricing to yours and a lot of business owners have gone have never done that and uh or they've got this mentality of i don't want to overcharge or i you know they want to try and compete on price and there's a whole lot of mentality around that that we try to unpack and and explained, which then feeds back into the whole strategy piece is, well, what is our business model? What's our strategy here? Uh, it could be fine to be competing on price. That might be a legitimate business model for you, but it's all intertwined and, again, comes back to that 10-year financial model so we can start to see and play around with assumptions and say, right, if we raise prices 20%, let's assume we might have a drop-off in the number of uptake, but what does that mean for the bottom line? It actually may be a healthier change to do that. Awesome. Thank you. Is there coaching through the course and then after the course as well? What's going on there? Yeah, we have a 30 minute weekly one on one with a growth guide like myself, an experienced business owner. Uh, so we run through any actions we had since the last meeting. We ask uh, you know, any questions from the course material in the last week you've gone through. And then we get into, right, now what's your number one growth challenge at the moment? We talk about that, or well, they may just open up with an issue they're having. Usually it's around people. Uh, and then we can impart our our experience and advice around that, um, and either suggest another resource. Might be, I uh, yeah, heard this on a podcast two years ago. This specific issue you're going through, go and listen to this one, or read this book, or this chapter of this book, or I tried that, didn't work. This is what I did, or go and speak with someone in my network that has you know gone through exactly what you're going through right now. Fantastic. How many times have you run this program? Uh, it's been going for a year now. It's, it took a couple of years to write. I'd go to a cafe every morning, spend an hour and just knock out, you know, a thousand words or, or more easily because it's all so, you know, ingrained in my last 25 years and I, I know exactly what I want to say. It took a long time to edit it and structure it all the right way, et cetera. But yeah, we launched it a year ago, early 2024. And yeah, we're having some really terrific businesses and business owners going through it. And uh, I just love hearing the aha moments. We run a survey every four weeks. So there's four through the whole 16 weeks and feedback's amazing. And, and the scores and we ask what, you know, three things that you've learned, three, uh, anything, what, one thing we should change or uh, in, in the program and any other feedback. And we're really, really happy with what we're hearing from all our um, students. Awesome. I want to dive into that, maybe some of the things you're hearing and some of the feedback you're getting. But before we do that, how big are the cohorts typically at this point? Yeah, we keep it to a group of eight business owners because we have a monthly group call with the business owners and the growth guide. So they all get to know each other. They can share their pain of the last month quite openly. Uh, and we, you know, we down the track, we may offer a wider community, we're, something we're looking at at the moment. But after the program ends, um, if they've got a good rapport with their growth guide, then they can do that one on one coaching uh, with them um, outside of the program. But that's not something we offer per se. It's it's the, up to the growth guide and their students to discuss. 
So, so say that again, there, there's a growth guide that's on your team that's helping bring people through and perhaps after the fact that growth guide can continue coaching outside of what you're, of what you've yep. created here. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I've, I've got a few that I still help uh, that have completed the program and they, they can either be keep the weekly one-on-one 30 minutes uh, each week, or it can be fortnightly. And then uh, after a while that may even go out to monthly, but we don't recommend monthly. Definitely start, keep the weeklies until you're finding there's not as many issues and you go to um, fortnightly every two weeks after that and maybe monthly. Cool. And then, so you spoke to an intimate group of, of eight, of eight business owners so that on these weekly, or I think you might've said monthly, monthly group yep. calls, uh, um, people can share their pain uh, because yes. it's intimate. And talk to me about that. What's going on there? What are you hearing? Or yeah, it's been really fun. I mean, it's forty-five minutes. I, I run a really tight agenda, so we always start on time, finish on time. We go around the table, and I first ask what what, what was your number one growth challenge in the last month, and any wins. Go around the table, and then people chime in and give their advice, or go and talk to this person. Or I had a really good consultant help me with this. Here's their details. So the group really helps each other out, which is fantastic. And then we close it out by saying, "What's the number one priority for each person for the next month? What's their focus going to be?" Um, and it, it just agitates the the discussion. So it's more than just the one on one with the growth guide each week. It's that monthly, um, you know, cohort that get together and help each other out. So it sounds like there's great networking opportunities yep. as well. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. What sort of breakthroughs or or give me some fun stories on these one on one or on these monthly uh, group sessions with the eight of you or nine of you? I suppose it is you plus the eight. Like what? Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that because they're all generally from different industries, so someone will have a marketing problem, whereas another business you know, has never had a marketing problem or they've nailed their marketing right out the gate or they're maybe a marketing business. So they can give advice specifically to that student or that owner that's having marketing issues at the moment. Um, and we've we've seen a bit of, you know, cross sales, helping each other out, different businesses as well. Uh, and people letting other owners into their network and get, you know, when it comes to, for example, hiring, um, they've been, it's been really great to watch the the cross pollination there of, of sharing and, and helping others. Yeah. Fantastic. What's the weekly, the person who runs the weekly call, what, what did you call them again? A growth guide. So they're, they're an experienced business owner. They've owned at least one of their own businesses and grown them. Um, they've got, they've had the success and the pains uh, and they, you know, so they're, they're talking to, because we find a lot of coaches out there either have never run a business, particularly with team members, um, or they're, they're just, they're not very good. You know, their their advice is pretty shitty. And that's something that we wanted to, to correct because we think business coaching should be done differently. And then the growth guides having weekly calls, perhaps these calls continue after the 16 week course. Are we, are you hearing, are the growth guides hearing both tactical, strategic, issues as well as mindset issues or does it tend to lead one way or the other yeah well that in all three courses we we start with mindsets we, we go through mindsets we think they need to adopt or change then we talk about habits that they need to to build and then the last piece uh the tools that they need to implement you know all those changes um so sometimes it is mindset um other times it's like you know it's the people issues uh, and, and getting the business model right as well is is critical. So we've seen owners totally change their business. For example, uh, um, one of our uh, past students really niched down and has found great results because they can um, tighten up their marketing, they can charge more, and they streamline the, the back of the business as well, the back office. So it's having someone outside the forest you're standing there looking for trees and you can't see them someone that's not in the weeds they can just ask a simple question and go have you thought about this or doing it this way or this concept well, a great one is have you thought about raising your prices no i've never done that since i started for example you know so it's, it's good having someone independent that's not emotionally tied up uh and it's been through walk the road that you're, you're going down at the moment and and can give that gentle advice or ask uh, questions that will get you you know really thinking 
sounds like um, it's good. I, I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm, I'm also, I'll, I'll get to it. Um, I, the, tell me about the feedback you're getting. So you're doing the exit, the exit calls or, or you're sending out the emails or, or having these conversations about what worked, what didn't work. What do you like? What, what, get, what feedback are you getting? Yeah, it, it's a mix of uh, the, you know, the people, the things they learn about managing people, leading people. They never thought, you know, doing a weekly one-on-one -on -one with each direct report is was worth doing it. But as we talk about in one of the great books that we get them to read, you know, there's three powers in a workplace. There's role power, there's technical power, and then there's relationship power. And role power is I'm your boss, still as I say, or I'm going to sack you, basically. You, you're walking around with a sign on your head that says uh, I could fire you any time. A technical power is I know more about this topic than I do, so I get an extra vote. But the most impactful power in the workplace is relationship power, that you build a good, strong relationship, professional relationship with your direct reports. And the only way to do that is to spend time with them and talking about things that they want to talk about, not you dictating to them. And that's the weekly one-on-one. -on -one. So that's a that's been a real game changer. It's the number one management tool we recommend is doing those 30-minute weekly one-on-ones. And the course and our coaching helps them really nail that. And the feedback we're getting is phenomenal, as is another um, people tool we give them is an anonymous a quarterly team survey. So there's 19 questions. We've taken 12 of those questions from one of the best management books um, that I've read years ago, which is, again, recommended reading in the, in the course alongside um, as you're going through. And just the aha moments and the wow, when they get that feedback from their team, just some of the comments that helps them change little things around the business, but also it's a good measure to see whether the managers are doing their job well, um, because 70% of people quit their manager, not their job. They quit their manager. That's how bad this is out there. Um, managers aren't trained. Uh, they don't know how to, to you know build those professional relationships with their team and get more out of them by delegating down as well. Mm. Are you able to help these business owners grow and get less busy? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I, on my weekly podcast, I've actually had two great examples of owners that have done this. And I talk, we, we talk about them in, in the course material as well. Um, one had a plumbing business in Sydney called Dr. Drip, and uh, he got to 17 uh, team members, plumbers mainly, and by the time they sold that business a couple of years ago, they'd had it for 20 years. He started off as the sole plumber and built it up to 17. And then two years ago, sold it. And Andy was only working two hours a week in that business. That was it because he was able to set the business up uh, to, to run without him. He just looked at the management reports each week, had a, had a meeting with the management team, um, and that was it. So we're finding... Um, that it's you know quite powerful if you know what to do if you can let go delegate climb up that org chart so you can very much at, reduce your hours but you've got to a get recruit the right people a players and then let them get on with the job basically that's amazing what was the other one you said there was a couple of stories we have dr drip what's the next one yeah, Carolee Fontanelli, probably had her on the cast about three years ago, a lovely lady, a Kiwi, moved from New Zealand to Sydney, I think it was, uh, joined her then husband's one-person law firm. Um, he kind of gave up. She took it over. she just finished law school herself and um, she inherited with that business half a million dollars in debt and within two or three years had sold that, uh, sorry, had, had paid that debt back, which was great, and now she's got... Uh, Last time I checked in with her, hopefully catching up with her next week, actually, when I'm up, up in the Gold Coast, she had a team of 17 pe uh, people in her law firm. She Again, also, she niched down into just doing a particular part of family law, and she works 10 hours a week in that business. Um, most of her time is on management and marketing, so just checking with the, the management team, and then she loves the marketing part of the business, so she's kept that. Otherwise, she could do what Andy did and get down to probably get down to two hours a week, just that management time. Um, so that's a great example. So we've got some of our students in our program that have definitely seen their, their work hours reduced. They're feeling more in control, and they're seeing the business grow because a lot of the time it's the owner is standing in their own way. What was the the second example? Her name, Catherine. Is that what you oh, said? Car Carol Lee Fontanelli. Yeah, Carol Lee Fontanelli. 
I'm I'm envisioning th- these two people. You've got Andy and Carol Lee, and and Carol Lee not you know inherits a whole bunch of five hundred thousand in debt, which yikes. And then you've got Andy, and how about the adjustment to to that to 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 going down to a two hour work work week or a ten hour work week? Like, speak to that a little bit. Yeah. Well, they both got you know, we're wise and smart, invested a lot in their own professional development. I, I do 10 hours a week myself, listening to books, audio books, podcasts, et cetera. And they did the same. They swatted up on the best business books. They got their their mindset right. So Andy and Carolee both knew that they shouldn't be doing the technical work. They needed to climb up to the manager level of the org chart and eventually to the business owner or entrepreneur level, as Gerber talks about in the EMIT. So putting in standard operating procedures, putting in systems, automating things, Get, nailing the hiring, getting A players on the team. Um, and and for them both, particularly for Carolee, I think, getting the marketing right, so niching down, getting the messaging. Uh, and that in p- part of doing that, she discovered her love for marketing, hence why she still kept that corner of the business. So, yeah, it can be done. Um, you've just got to wa- genuinely want that change to happen because there is a bit of work to get the changes in. Um, and then it is totally achievable to be owning a business and, and working hardly any hours in it. If I talked to both of them right now and we had them on this podcast and I said, hey, uh, imagine your life working two hours a week or 10 hours a week and you're working 10 hours a week, you're only doing what you love now and marketing. Do you think they'd have been able to comprehend that? Or do you think they'd have said, I don't actually want that anyway? Or... Does that question make sense? Yeah, it, it's. I think it's another mindset problem, or maybe it's a habitual thing. I've certainly suffer. I'm afflicted by it. Is that I love what I do so much. I, I have a propensity to work too much. So I've got to put things in place so I don't work that much. So there is. You could have the option to work two hours a week, and then other people will say, "Well, I I'm going to get bored. I want what else am I going to do?" So they've they've both gone off and done other businesses. But the other great thing about both those examples is what they've done is created a very valuable business because if they can prove that they the business doesn't actually need them, they will get a higher multiple of, of their profit or EBITDA when they sell their businesses. So they then. Because they're not just sitting on a beach or off sailing or playing golf, they've just gone off and started another business or two after that, but created this asset. Uh, so I do think that that is a, 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 a risk. Some business owners just love what they do. I certainly have that problem. And so I've got to make sure that I've got things in my calendar to keep me away from work, like taking my chocolate lab for a walk every day or playing sport and catching up with friends, for example, hobbies. It's, it's beautiful. I, I love the vision too of hey, uh, you you've effectively turned your business now into an asset instead of a ninety hour a week job for the owner, and now if they do like building businesses, they can go build another one, yeah, or another or another. That's a great vision, I think. Yeah, absolutely, and also you know some people's identity and their egos tied up in it. So we do talk to that sometimes if we identify. Why aren't they letting go? And it can be they just, there could be some self-worth issues um, from childhood. Uh, we try to understand what's driving that, that decision to stay in the weeds and and why wouldn't you want to build a more valuable business and just have the option to work two hours a week if you want, or like Carol Lee, keep the marketing corner and and work a, a few more hours. Sounds like you're going pretty deep with these, with these, with these uh, students that you're bringing in. Well, I've been through a lot of pain and, you know, uh, harmed a lot of relationships over my years in in business because I was too focused on work and growing my businesses. And so that's something I'm very passionate about is helping people, not just like in Carol Lee's example, not get into debt. She obviously fought her ex-husband out of that debt, that business, but also just having that balance and, and, you know, because no one... I've seen it. A lot of people can spend too much time in their businesses because they they think they're doing it for the right reasons to make the family financially secure. But the problem is, twenty or thirty years later, when they get to that point, they sell their business and they go turn around to their family and say, "Great, now I've got all this time I want to spend with you." The kids and and their partner say, "Well, we don't know you. We actually don't want to spend any time with you." So I've seen that, and there's a heap of things there that I you know want to help other business owners avoid and not fall for those traps some of those traps that i've I've fallen into and i've seen others as well so i'm really really passionate about that Mm -hmm. 
I'm imagining there's some there's some tension throughout the course. I don't know if tension's the right word, but these growth moments of of uh yeah, growth like yeah, maybe am I am I hearing reading that right? Yeah, I've got to pick my timing. So obviously build the rapport with the person, but I, I don't pull any punches. So if if I I'm pretty clear on my opinion. Um, our one-on-ones are rapid fire. We talk a lot. Uh, I'll listen, you know, but I'll pick up these small things in in the way they the words they use or recurring themes, and then I'll raise a, a delicate topic like that. Well, maybe you're addicted to running your business, and you know, you, your balance is out of whack with your relationships and your family. And then I'll give them a personal sto- a story of, you know, how that's affected me um, uh, to really drive home the point to say I really think you need to you should think about changing the way you're thinking about this and, and let's talk about it next week or the week after, but here's the risks I see or the experience that I've been through and what we're talking about right now. And I, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Mm-hmm. I'm, 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 I'm imagining there's a lot of hitting bottom moments and then incredible growth and change coming out of those. It's probably the cycle of, of, Oh, just ouch. And then, the 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 growth coming out of it like the pain is the touchstone for growth yeah absolutely and you know, we've, we've had a few uh owners in tears and frustration mainly around people again and that was having toxic people on on their bus um or b players so and that's just supporting them to work through that to say well you know what you need to do here. Um, now it's just a matter of doing it. You've got to exit this person. I've held on to people far too long, B players and C players, because I, you know, I had an emotional attachment to them or I couldn't pull the trigger or I was going to feel bad. But as Brene Brown says, clear is kind. You've just got to say, this is not working out. It's me, not you. I didn't do a good job as a manager because either um, I didn't recruit an A player or and or I didn't manage you and the team well. So it's my fault, not yours. This is not working out. And so to coach them and how to frame those conversations, those delicate conversations, for example, if it's a, a team member they need to exit, um, but also really challenging challenging them on their thinking or about what they think the problem is at the moment and maybe turning that uh, thinking to something else where which could actually be the root cause of what, what's going on. Yeah. I'm I'm imagining someone's listening or watching right now and they're relating as we've gotten deeper into the reality of of what could be painting somebody or or why they go, yeah, I need to get into this business transformation program. Do you find I'm imagining these owners who feel strapped for time already are thinking I don't have time to go through a 16 week program. That must be a common, common it thing is. that you hear. Yeah. Yeah. Which is exactly why I cut it down to 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes a weekday. So it's two and a half hours a week. You get a short daily email, which says there's a, you know, a few words to prime the lesson for that day to, to get them thinking in, in, in an area that I want them to think about that day, plus a quote in one of my favorite quotes at the top. And then the first action, growth action at the bottom of that email is a link through to that part of the course they need to read that day. might only be a t- 10 minutes of reading of what I've written. Uh, and then the other gr- two or three growth actions will be to, you know, copy this template, tailor it to you, use it, et cetera. And so it's, but all up, that's 30 minutes a day working on the business um, led by that daily email. And then, then the recommended readings right after that saying, well, the, the current book you should be reading is this. Um, we recommend 30 minutes a day on one and a half speed so you get through more material. And so, you know, that's that professional development. It's building that habit of professional development. So at least two and a half hours a week, we recommend small business owners and their team should be developing themselves by listening to audio books and podcasts um, to, to expand their thinking and put new ideas into their brain. Mm-hmm. When would someone who's joined your course that feels the time crunch perhaps pass the curve of this feels like it's taking more time than I've got Add, adding this on to, oh yeah, my time is is freeing up. They, they start to feel that, yep. that return. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. We start off a little bit light uh, at the beginning of the course, but I've actually timed everything out so eight read eight minutes of the court this lesson will take you eight minutes to, to read then copy this template tailor that'll take you seven minutes and then 15 minutes to do the third action for that day whatever it may be so i've actually stepped it out 
and time and, and so we can say to to the owners that it's 30 minutes a day working on the business if you don't think you've got 30 minutes to to do make the changes in your business that are going to give you the lifestyle you signed up for then you know this is not going to help you nothing well i don't think anything's going to help you if you're not prepared to do at least 30 minutes a day i'm imagining the next thing where people feel hesitancy about jumping into something like the the business transformation program is their ego is getting in the way or they're overthinking it or maybe they're thinking man if somebody knew i jumped into something like this um any any can you speak to any of that yeah, before we recommend someone does our program, because a lot of people I speak with, it's not relevant for them either. They've got less than five team members or even 30, so we recommend they do other courses or other programs if they're bigger. Um, and then other people, part of those discussions before we, we recommend they sign on to the program is to find out if they're committed to the change or maybe their ego is in, in, way and they, in the way and they don't think they need to change or as much or they know it all. Um, because we we can't help those people if they're not prepared to be vulnerable, drop the guard and say, well, okay, I'm, I'm open to learning new things and be challenged. So if they're a bit protective, uh, you know, we can't help them. So we recommend, we'll give them some resources, read the E-Myth, here's three or four other books, here's some marketing books if you've got a marketing problem, for example, and we'll, we'll send them on to, to something else. But yeah, that is a challenge, but that all comes up back to you know making sure the right people are in the program that are open to change and doing the work that's needed yeah are you comfortable talking about the price of your program of the business transformation uh, program it, at all or? well it's changes because we're putting it up a thousand dollars each time we open it at the moment until we find the right the right price so um yeah i don't know what to say on that <laughs> They could anticipate from here to here. You have a band. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, it's over ten thousand Aussie, so um, you know, and it's going up every time we open the group at the moment. Till we we settle on because we're all also adding more uh, content to the courses and more tools each time we open it. So we're putting it up at you know thousand dollars every. Um, we open it June, March, June, and September. We don't open in December because Christmas gets in the way. So it's three times a year we open it. And yeah. at the moment, yeah, it's over ten thousand dollars and increasing by thousand dollars each each open at the moment. So we find we feel we're at the right price point for the Yeah. I'm I love the way you talk about the the tactical nature of it. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but you get an email and here's the three things that you do, you know, half an hour. Here's the form, do it, apply it to your business in this way so you can see the results. Bam. Next day, same thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because I've found with a lot of courses, particularly books, though, there's a lot of great ideas and thought-provoking things in there, but often there's not an action plan at the end of what you should do, or sometimes it's just too overwhelming or not well-structured. So hence why we've put it into the 16-week course. You've got 80 emails over that that time, very short daily emails on the weekdays, and to guide them through, right, as I said before, if I could jump in the DeLorean and go back in time, this is all the stuff that I'd give myself in order of learning about, right, I'm ready to grow my first business. I've got five team members now. I know the pain of managing, let alone recruiting people. Um, I want to I want to get better at all this. And then this steps you right through. So recruitment's a big one. We've got a separate course outside of the program called the Ultimate Recruitment Toolkit, which is another two-week course. And that helps people become much better at hiring managers or recruiters. Uh, plenty of tools and there's a playbook at the end they can just copy and tailor because <laughs> recruitment's so important. I love it. You're you're no bones about all this stuff. I love yeah. it. I sense it. I I can I can tell. It's like I'm not here to to waste your time or, or talk fluffy. Like let's let's no. knock it out. Let's get it done. Action. Let's, That's right. Yeah. There's yeah. an acronym I made up last year. SFA um, called which is keep things simple, uh, be focused, and take the right action. So SFA. Simple focus action. It's good. Uh, what's the number one way you're getting people into your course right now? Well, I'd say our podcasts. You know, we just cracked 500 live episodes recently, getting great feedback. Um, we haven't really done much marketing of the podcast, but it's growing every month. And because people get to know my style, how I operate, I'm very direct. Um, I'm polite, but I don't hold punches, like I said before. 
if I think that they need to change their thinking on something and and then I'll I'll be I'll come right out. I won't I won't beat around the bush. And then that re- uh, resonates with some people. So I've had uh, so, uh, people reach out and say that uh, yeah, actually a good a good example is two or three years ago. So we had the program launch a year ago, but while I was still putting it together, I had a few coaching clients still one on one, but then got maxed out. And on, on the website, it said coaching were fully fully maxed. And uh, Scott. Um, He's got a migration business on the Gold Coast. Great, great business. He reached out and said, I know you don't have any more coaching slots yet, but we need help. You know, please help. I'm listening to two episodes a day to go through the back catalog. And so it obviously resonated with him, my style. uh, And they've gone gangbusters. So they've gone from two and a half full time equivalents to 18 months later after working with me to 14 full time equivalents. And they're both the two founders who are also life partners work 40 hours a week. And I'm, you know, and they don't do billables anymore. They're working on the two two main growth levers of people and marketing. Scott loves the marketing, he handles that. And Tana looks after the the building the team and managing the team. That is awesome. The Grow a Small Business Podcast, the Grow a Small Business yep. Business Podcast. It's on all the platforms. Um I, I think yeah, Scott and Tainer's business is a good example of why we put the program together because I started working with them probably a year before we launched the program, and I've said this before on one of our casts. So pretty much everything I've ta- taught them over the year before we launched the program is in the program, but they would have been able to get there much faster if we had the program when Scott first reached out because, like I said, I'm repeating myself 80% of the time. So putting them into those daily emails and the courses – more business owners can be going through the, the teachings at the same time rather than just waiting for me to have that one-on-one and repeat the message I've just repeated in the last meeting, if that makes sense. It does. It makes total sense. I want to I want to know about your um, Distillers Institute, and you've had 600 people go through that. You've had 60 people start a distillery uh, as a result of that. Last time I talked, it could be more. Mm-hmm. Um what was the cost on that or what is the cost on that understanding that it's likely to go up? Well, of course, yeah, we have an anti black Friday sale where we put the courses up by a hundred dollars every black Friday. Um, <laughs> <That's> uh, <amazing. laughs> it, it's 1795 Aussie dollars for course one and course one is seven modules and it's, it's there to help you make the decision, get to the decision gate at the end. Am I in or out? Is this something I should do? So we, really and it's on the business side of distilling it's not the te- technical side of how to make great spirit it's do your market research put a business plan together a marketing plan and there's a five-year financial model included in in that course as well as well as our private facebook group plus our we've got a suppliers list that you know if you need to get a, a bottling uh, supplier for example and we have a monthly webinar where we interview a, a distillery owner and hear about their journey and the wins and the pains they've had and that's been hugely successful. The feedback's been phenomenal. Um, so that's seventeen hundred ninety-five Aussie dollars. Course two is yep. I'm in now. What do I do? How do I set up in twelve months? So we're in that. It's a lot more templates, production material, uh, managing uh, material as well. Marketing is a big area, and a ten-year financial model in that as well, which is built specifically for distilling a uh, distilling business, which is quite complex. Uh, and a giant Gantt chart, over 100 line items, like here's how to set up a, a distilling business in less than 12 months, go through these phases, here are the tasks and the steps, and that's 4695 at the moment, Aussie. And how long have you been running this? We launched that four years ago, just over four years ago now, and yeah, I've been really pleased to see 10% of the 600 students through those two courses uh, open their own distillery and, and and going really well. We launched in New Zealand early last year. We're considering launching in the US maybe next year in 2025. And actually next month we launched the sister business for the, called the Brewers Institute, uh, doing the same thing on the business side. If someone's thinking of starting a craft brewery in Australia, those two courses will be available, ta- obviously tailored to brewing uh, for, for that, that industry. Any, what are the big takeaways you are, bringing from your distiller's course into your into your business transformation program? Yeah, I, th- I would say the 10-year financial model because when I, I wrote those two, uh, the five-year one for course one and then the 10-year one for course two, and the feedback we got from the students were, was amazing because they could actually look into the future and see, right, 
if I sold a bottle of gin at $65 and and then how many units they thought they'd sell each year, uh, they could see the return and then they, they could tweak those assumptions around and say, right, what if it was $99 but less volume sold, then actually that's a better return, less work, et cetera. So having the numbers that they could play with really informed their decision. So when I started writing the, the, the business transformation program, um, that ten-year financial model is is the centerpiece, you know, for the strategic planning to really help, um, you know, the owners make the right decisions, and with their management team as well, take that next year's um, forecast, turn it into a budget, put it into your accounting package, run your bu- budget versus actual each month, see what the variances are, etc. So um, that that's probably the biggest thing I've taken out of the Distillers Institute into the, the program. It's mm, good. It's good. Very powerful. In three minutes or less, what is the one thing that you see that impedes the solopreneur to getting to the five person, the five person business to where you jump in and help? I would say it's that control thing. I need to do everything hard to let go. Uh, also, funding. So if you're not capitalized well enough, you can't hire the people to get the to keep for you to keep clambering up the org chart. So funding can be an issue as well. Again, coming back to that 10-year financial model, if you can put all that, those in and you can see, right, we're going to be short 100 grand, we need to raise some money or go to the bank or whatever, um, obviously you need to have strong financial controls to make sure you spend the money wisely. But often people will hire, start hiring people too late and or hire cheap. They'll get B players in, C players. Rather than investing in A players, you may need to pay a little bit more. But the chasm between an A and a B player is massive. You get like five times the output of a, an A player as opposed to a B player. That's mistakes I certainly made early on in my career. Before we jumped live here, so about an hour ago, uh, we were talking uh, really quickly about email. And on my podcast, I've had a bunch of people speaking to email, the power of email, and not only cold email, but uh, you know your email list that hopefully we're all building and nurturing. And you were saying, hey, the thought out there seems to be that email is dying. And you said, hey, no, it's actually the other way around. You want to speak to that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. So much so. So like I said before, we're not a marketing agency. I'm not a marketing guru. I, I love the marketing corner. I'm still swatting up on that. It's a fair bit of my professional development is still learning more about marketing. But there are common themes I come across with you know, students in our program or just other business owners talking with them in the marketing corner that I just can't believe they, they don't understand. So hence, we put together the marketing funding flywheel ebook, uh, which um, correct some of their thinking around this. Uh, um, so that's available on our website down in our footer. If you look under, there's some resources, links to resources in our footer to get that ebook. And w- there's a few key points I'm making there. And email marketing is one of them that it's not dead. Uh, and, and it's actually growing uh, as a return. So the Direct Marketing Association in America puts out stats every year on what channel is giving the greatest return. Email marketing, very dollar you invest in it, you get $44 back. The next best channel is SEO at $22 and social ads is after that at $20. And a lot of business owners just don't realize that. So you will find a lot of our students, they'll, they'll get a quick win out of that because I'll say, how big is your email list? And when was the last, how, how many times in the last year did you email them? Oh, twice. You know, I said, well, there you go. That's going to be a really quick win for you to get more customers in the door, um, and throwing them that ebook as well. Uh, all these other concepts, uh, particularly around SEO. I thought SEO was dead a couple of years ago, and a lot of guests on my car schooled me on that and said, "No, no, it's still very relevant. Even in the age of AI, it's even more powerful because uh, a lot of people are just stuffing AI content out there, which is um, you know not working. Whereas the the human written content." With a little bit of AI as a draft, for example, is, is much more powerful. And SEO is becoming, you know, is, is still very, very relevant in marketing these days. Yeah, it's very powerful. I think too, with the election cycle coming in America, uh, the paid ads are becoming much more expensive. Stupid so expensive. money is, yep. yeah, so expensive. So those returns are going down now. But if you think about it, also, Misha, as I talk about in the ebook, if someone's searching in Google for something that you offer that their buying intent is much stronger than clicking on a Facebook ad, you know? So investing in SEO, one, it's it can be evergreen traffic you're getting. 
And two, the buying intent of the prospect is much higher. So it just makes so much more sense. And the other thing about the email marketing is platforms can change. So, um, you know, you, you may get kicked off your Facebook uh, um, platform. So you've lost all your followers, whereas you've got their email address. You, you guarantee you get in their inbox, whereas five to ten percent of your followers on socials these days will, will you you will end up in their feed only five to ten percent so it's much much more powerful yeah um troy i feel like we're just getting rolling here just getting warmed up <laughs> we could really go on and like on. i didn't have an extra coffee <laughs> <laughs> i do want to be cognizant of time uh especially it's uh it's getting late here in the states oh i know i did have one more question for you i wanted to know a little bit have some fun here what are the what are the most common misconceptions that an american or a foreigner might have towards you aussies tasmanians well the first one is is, uh, someone i only heard this again yesterday but i I often say to travel a lot for the whiskey company new zealand you know in europe and america etc and uh when i introduce myself that i'm from tasmania people think i'm from tanzania and i have to then explain to them no it's an island small island south of melbourne in australia called tasmania not tanzania so i think that's um yeah that's probably the the biggest misconception down here in tasmania anyway but um yeah yeah i i'm a i'm a surfer and i've surfed for many many years so i knew of ships turns bluff in tasmania and all that so i i was lucky to not commit that faux pas yeah yeah absolutely Yeah. Um, before we hit stop here and uh, say goodbye, inevitably when we hit stop, um, you might go, oh man, I wished I'd have said this or I wished I'd have said that or I meant to talk about this. Does anything come to your mind? That is a great question. I've listened to a few of your podcasts, actually. I should have prepared better for this because I know this one's right at the end. I, I think, I, I guess, t- talking to the audience, if you're a small business owner, you've got at least five team members and uh, you're having, you can't seem to grow to that next level. You're frustrated, you're working long hours, your lifestyle's out of whack, your health and your relationships aren't as healthy as they should be. Um, the, the biggest thing I can encourage people is to go on that professional development journey, build the habit. You know, I do 10 hours a week, like I said, to expand my mind and my knowledge uh, and just, you know, really work on yourself to, to, to find what change is needed to get your business to unlock that those problems in your business so you can actually work the hours you want to work not the 80 not when the you want to work those 80 hours so i think really develop that and i'm still surprised these days when i ask how much reading and listening that the people small business owners do and they often don't stop and and invest the time and you can there's dead time you can use i i do most of mine when i'm driving around town when i'm cleaning the house out walking the dog or I'm shooting hoops in the sun. That's when I do my learning. I listen to audio books. And thank you, Misha. I just wanted to, to thank you for what you do with your cast and also out, put to the audience um, if they can leave a review or follow you on Spotify and, and leave a rating on Spotify. As a fellow podcaster, I know how much, how important that is to get your podcast up the rankings and more pe- into more people's ears. So I want to uh, really appreciate what you do and, and ask the audience if they can um, return the favor by um, leaving a review and following you. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to hit stop and we'll say goodbye offline. Thanks, Misha. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Table Rush Talk Show. For resources to help you sell your stuff, go to B-E-L-O-V-E dot media forward slash resources. That's B-Love dot media forward slash resources. And be sure to subscribe, comment, five star and share. Thank you again for listening.